Hi, this is Eric from Longbox Review at longboxreview.wordpress.com. And this is Travis from Odd Phillips Thoughts on YouTube at Odd Phillips Thoughts. And uh, we are here today, Travis and I, to talk about Marvel Now. <laughs> Um, Travis, did you? I, I did not realize this when I contacted you uh, to do this particular episode. It is as we record this. This is April of 2013, and this is the six months since Marvel Now launched. Oh yeah. So there we're six months into Marvel Now. It was totally happens as I was. I was just thinking, you know what? I, Travis and I haven't recorded an episode recently, and what what's what's to talk about? What haven't we talked about before, really? And you know the Marvel stuff just kind of jumped out into the forefront of my mind. Yep. And so here we are. So it just, you know, happenstance, but it's, it's a good one. Um, let's see here. So we're going to talk Marvel. Now we're going to talk about the Marvel now comics that, uh, Travis and I read. We're not going to talk about everything. Obviously if we, if we haven't read it, why talk about it? Right. Right. <laughs> uh, but first Travis, I wanted to call attention to a, a, a listener of the podcast. I got some feedback from this gentleman. Um, couple days ago looks like almost a week ago i don't know doesn't matter time frame doesn't matter but this but the feedback does and this is from uh chris snell he is the chris snell on twitter and uh i tweeted uh, d- oh uh, let me since we're talking about marvel uh here in a minute travis let me back up for a second did you take advantage of that uh marvel promotion the 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 free 700 plus number one issues you mean the one that shut down the servers the first time they tried doing it? Yeah, the first time. Did you were you able to? No. Oh, you didn't. You didn't take advantage of that. I did. I did not. Ah, it was okay. digital. It was digital comics, so I did not protect. <laughs> That's right. Digital bad. <laughs> well, I just I loved it. I I, lo- I I loved it. I loved it because I loved it because it um the first time they attempted to do it and it screwed everything up and nobody could read their comics. I to me it kind of felt like it proved a point as another point as to why my paper comics are better, but. All right. Well, we'll we'll table that discussion. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, this all started with uh, because I did take advantage of it. Um, as I tweeted, out of the 700 plus number one issues from the Marvel promotion, I got 79. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Snell uh, asked me about that, and we had a, just a quick discussion about what we what we were, what we got and what we were looking forward to reading. And then, uh, unsolicited, he he said, I really enjoyed the previews episode from this week, which that was the last episode uh, that I released. Made me second-guess some things I overlooked. Can't wait for next episode. So I thanked him, of course, because I I really appreciate the feedback uh, that I get for the podcast. And and so he uh, then he responded, uh, I was bummed when it was over because it meant I had to wait for the next one. That was really nice of him. And uh, okay, let's let's move on, Travis. Let's talk Marvel now. All right, so back in, let's see, I'm looking at a press release from Marvel. Um, this was released on July 5th of 2012 uh, from Marvel.com. And so what you know, what is Marvel now is the question that they asked. And Tom Brevoort said, Marvel Now is a coordinated creative refresh across our entire publishing line, a unique moment in which the creative reigns on virtually all of our quintessential series are being passed from one person to another. Um, And then Joe Quesada said, is the next step in uh, Marvel Now is the next step in Marvel story evolution and character evolution. It's not a reboot. (laughs) <laughs> little, little, I think a little slam towards DC there at that time. Sure. It is a universe-shifting catch-all, which really just tells fans that if you enjoyed Avengers vs. X-Men, get ready for what the outcome is, because there's some major, major changes coming to the Marvel Universe. Uh, a lot of changes to the character status quos, alter egos, costumes, creator shifts, design shifts, the way that we do our covers, digital, blah, 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 blah. And I, I don't, I'm not saying blah, 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 to to poo-poo Casada stuff. I'm just, okay, That that's enough. That's what Marvel Now was intended. And hmm. so Travis and I are going to talk about the about that and about the particular comics that we are reading. So, oh, one more thing I wanted to um, point out, Travis. So when this was first announced, you and I talked uh, on one of the episodes. I can't remember uh, which one it was now, but <laughs> I think one of us said something that this was a response to the success of the uh, new 52 from DC sure, or something along that line. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and while I still think that is probably partially true, 
I did, and you you know, take take this guy at his word. I did listen to an interview with Jonathan Hickman, who is currently on the the, the Avengers books, um, where he talked about because because he was asked this. This is on Ward Balloon, I believe, and so John Suntress asked him about that or or brought it up in some way. Anyway, Hickman's response to that was that it was not a response to the New Fifty Two because they had they had been talking about this before that was even announced because some people were they were starting into their final stories because they wanted to move on to other things and so management at Marvel decided you know why not just do this across instead of doing it for maybe one or two creators do this across the line and you know kind of, as they said refresh it and and bring in these other these other voices for these characters or these storylines or whatever so uh, you be the judge I guess on that I, I th- ah! I kind of think it's there's some truth to to both those things, but uh, let me get my hip waders on. <laughs> so, are you firmly in the camp that uh, Travis that this is that it was a response to the new Fifty Two? Sure, it may have been convenient, but I think it definitely, it's definitely uh, I, I I believe 100 percent that it's a response to the to the sales shift that happened, and they needed to do something. They couldn't stay with the status quo because yeah. there was a shales shift. So they had a response. Now, I mean, it, it may have worked out well that, you know, for them to do that. And, and that's that's great. I, I'm not I'm not holding that against them. But them to try and say that it's not a, that it's not a response, I think, is. I, I don't know who they think they're fooling uh, is, is how I look at it. So, <laughs> well, it is kind of a embarrassing when Aquaman outsells any Marvel comic that one month. Yep. I just want to point that out. See, Aquaman <laughs> Travis is cool. No, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> All right, but we're not here to talk about DC. Uh, let's talk about Marvel now. So what we're going to do is uh, we're just gonna, we're going we're gonna to take a step back into time and uh, talk about the the stuff that was released back in October of 2012, and move our way up in time to what's been uh, released now. And just talk in general about what we like about these comics and what we don't like and, and who knows what else. So I, I'm, I'm glad you reread that, that news brief thing, you know, their announcement and whatnot, uh-huh. you know, cause it says stuff in there. Like it's going to be a change in all this stuff. Did it really though? I mean, it covers the covers, the way we, they would look at covers. Have they changed other than having that, that red ugly stripe red bar? Oh God! I wish that would go away. Was was, was that the fundamental change? Because their covers haven't changed. I mean, seriously. They, I, I don't know. It's, I, I think maybe in some ways, but I, I didn't really pay attention to them to the Marvel covers before this. And you know, quite honestly, I didn't read a whole lot of Marvel comics before the the Marvel yeah. Now thing. Well, you know, I certainly wasn't either. But I don't see how they look like comic books to me. I guess so. I don't know. I don't know how. No, wait a minute. What, what do you mean by that? They don't look like comic books. No, they look like comic books. That's what I'm saying. They don't. They don't. There's nothing about them that's so fundamentally oh different different than what it always has been. Yeah. I you know. Yeah, to I make that big statement. I mean, if we're if we're looking at you know as a whole, did they follow through with what they said it was going to be? And other than changing creators, I don't know if they follow if they've fallen you know if they follow through or not. You know, I will. Just, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that that I don't know. You know that, that that bold statement. What? Did, how much of that did they really, um, you know, uh-huh. accomplish, or meet, or you know, bring to us? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would agree with that in general. That's 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 for sure. Um, just because I have these two comics right here on my desk as as we're recording this, Travis, I'm looking at the Fearless Defenders number three issue and Hawkeye number nine, and it, I think especially the Hawkeye the Hawkeye covers. You, you'd have to agree those. That's different. Well, that's that book is just different in it, general. Right. That book is right. that book that is, is different a example. from the Marvel line. That that entire book is different from the Marvel line. That, that's true. I, I agree. But and that book that book existed before the um, That's true. Marvel. Yeah. yeah. And you know, of course that's that's David Aja's um, contribution. But but I, right. I think it's a good example. And then Fearless Defenders, I what I've liked about what I've liked about those covers, we're jumping ahead of ourselves, but a little bit, but what I've liked about these covers is that, you know, a lot of the comics, especially DC does this a lot too, because there's, there's a, there's a certain style, right? You have, you have the, there's the logo, you have the DC uh, brand logo, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Marvel used to have that as well. 
to some degree. Um, but now it's, I don't know, the, at least with Fearless Defenders, it's like the image is the most important part. And they incorporate the, the logo in there somehow. Like this this number three issue, it's 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 presented as almost like a tattoo on the back of Hippolyta. Right. I guess you're right. I guess that I guess it did. They did change the fact. That's what their. Now that you've said that, I remember that was their comment about how they were going to change the way it was. That the art was going to be the important thing, and that they would work the logo in somewhere. Yeah. Around, and that's why you get a lot of those Avenger books where. Yeah, the Avenger logo is tucked in somewhere along the way. Yeah. I guess I don't get many of those books, though. <laughs> and I'm looking at some others that I just happen to have here, all new X-Men. You know, the logo's on there, but it's kind of off in the corner behind the characters. The Marvel Now logo that they have, that red and white thing, that that's that's on all of these. Uh, but uh, in different places sometimes. The Wolverine issue number two, you know, that Marvel Now thing is up at the top above the the title. As opposed to the bottom where a lot of these are. I guess I guess I don't collect the books that there that those are changes in, mm-hmm. I guess, with the exception of maybe Red She Hall. Because I mean most of them like Captain Marvel, it the bear's always in the same you know, it's always in the same place. Captain America, I believe, is too. I don't have the books sitting right in front yeah. of me. Yeah. You know, Fantastic well, Force seems to all be but yeah. But, but there is some it seems there is some variation there. Um although, you know, there there's not I mean there's not a whole lot of variation they can do because, you know, they have a certain amount of space. And they have to have the brand on there somehow, and that horrible red banner. Um, at least, at the very least, I will say this: this just an aside. Um, they're they're now in that red banner. They're promoting Iron Man three coming out on May third. At least that is a tiny little part of that red that red banner, as opposed to the uh, that horrible green banner that is all about Arrow, the TV C, TV series Arrow from D, uh, on the DC comics. Oh yeah, that's, that's so awful. sick of that. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Sorry, See? didn't mean to railroad. <laughs> no, no, that's good. I, I, that, I, that's a, that's a, that's a great point you bring up. So, all right, let's well, let's talk about the the comics themselves and see how they measure up to what um, the Marvel executives were saying or were uh, said about it. Okay, first up, so Marvel now started in uh, October 2012 with, uh, and like I said, we're only going to talk about the comics that we read. Travis and I, and uh, the official, I guess the the real kind of identity brand relaunch title was Uncanny Avengers. That was the new comic coming out uh, that month. That was kind of like I, the flagship, I guess, if you will, for for this whole initiative. Uh, so let's talk about that one. And then the other one is Red She Hulk number fifty eight. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But let's talk about Uncanny Avengers. Um, there are six issues out so far as as we record this. And uh, this is by Rick Remender and John Cassidy on uh, issues one through four. And then uh, Olivier uh, Coipel came on, did number five, and Daniel Acuna did number six, as far as the art goes. And so this, uh, this, this was a, result, a direct result of the whole Avengers vs. X-Men um, event, uh, and where you get a team of some Avengers and some X-Men together, and what did we think of this, Travis? What were your thoughts on Uncanny Avengers? Well, I only got issue number one. I guess I got the book with the impression that I, I was under the impression that it was something that that we could pick up, and um, it would be new reader friendly. You know, I didn't have to have a bunch of knowledge of what was going on beforehand to be able to embrace the um, the book, and. Um, my entire household um, reads comics, and because I have some knowledge of Marvel, I spent a lot of time explaining to everybody else what the heck was going on in the book. I I, I didn't really care for what I read of the Avengers versus X Men um, event, and so I wasn't really excited by this book either. That's why I only got issue one of it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well. Uh... Okay, so I I have been getting this <laughs> this title. Um, I will say I did like I, I agree with everything you said about about the number one issue. It was uh, for something that was the, like I said the flagship, uh-huh. this whole initiative. It it was too much tied to something else that you would have had to have read before the initiative uh, came out, and and uh, I think that was a perhaps a bad choice uh, on Marvel's part. Um, but 
let's see. I did just in general. I did enjoy that first story, that, you know, because it, it involved the Red Skull um, hacking up Professor Xavier and taking his brain. <laughs> Spoilers out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and 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 basically somehow, you know, it's comics, so these things can happen. Somehow able to access the telepathic abilities of this dead um, X-Men <laughs> and and essentially kind of taken over New York or at least an area of New York and uh, bending Thor to his will, uh, which was that was bad. Um, that, that was an interesting storyline. I, I, it was it was OK. I, I enjoyed it for the most part uh, where it's going. Too much delays. Well, there were the delays. Yes, you're right. Um, Holy cows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but at least there's only six issues come out in six months, whereas you get some of these, like like all new X-Men, which we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes, you know, ten issues. Yeah, but it was but it was supposed to be more than six issues. I know. Right? In that know. amount of time? But okay. I'm, I'm kind of glad that, that they didn't. Well, sure, but... Just, just to save if my... You say, if you say this is what your um, I know, release it's... dates are going to be and your shipping's going to be and you're off by months, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there, you know, I hate to keep coming back to DC, but at the very, you know, say what you will about the internal workings at DC right now, uh, over mm-hmm. the last two years even, um, but at least things for the most part are coming out on time. And and yeah. and they did at at the very beginning of the New Fifty Two. I mean, they they came out right. I don't I right. don't recall. It's been two years, so I'm probably wrong. But I don't recall um, uh, any any books being shipped a month or two late nope right no so no. that that was you know but that that's you know but everybody everybody talked about that john cassidy on on a monthly book you know everyone kind of expected it not not that that's an excuse but so if you knew it <laughs> then why did they you <laughs> know why did they schedule appropriately for that i guess is my thing yeah yeah that's frustrating as a consumer to, to uh, um you know, to have that inconsistency and whatnot. Yeah, no, I agree. Especially I agree. in my case where it wasn't like it was on my pull. I was going to have to go to some chain store to attempt to buy it if I was going to buy the second issue and whatnot. And not really knowing whenever the heck it was going to come out made it even that more difficult for me to even want to attempt yeah. to get the second issue. Yeah. So, uh, Just to wrap it up on Uncanny Avengers, uh, I'm not sure where this book is going right now, though, after after that first storyline. So number five and six, I'm, uh, I, I'm, not, sure, I'm not sure where we're going. Uh, it involves something with uh, Kang, and, uh, which I, I actually like that character, but I don't know. I, this, this is probably a title I will be dropping in the very near future. Oh, and then there's that whole, that whole um, uh, kerfuffle uh, involving what Havoc said about mutants, you know, the M word. Did you hear about that, Travis? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Oh, you didn't hear about that? No. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So, uh, which was it issue five, I think, or six? I can't remember. In one of these yeah. issues <laughs> recently, um, after the events of uh, the, the Red Skull thing, um, Havoc had, or the Uncanny Avengers had a press conference and Havoc got up there and talked about how he doesn't like to be called a mutant. He doesn't think that's an appropriate word. Um, you know, they're just, they're just, he, you know, his response was, well, or, or uh, someone asked him from the crowd, you know, what do we call you then? And he said, call me Alex, you know, and then there, there was a, this uproar on the internet about that. And to me, that's not the really interesting part. The interesting part was Rick Remender's response to that, which is basically, you know, screw you guys. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And that's huh. my that's my editorial uh, editorializing of, of his comments. So you sh- you know people should go look that up. But that's that's how that's I- not that's but that's not even a new conversation, is it? Really? I I didn't think so, but it was okay. It was interesting why you know there's just this 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 uh, this feedback that Remender was getting, and he he was basically saying go away. I don't want to talk about this with you. So hmm. I, I that was weird. It, it was really strange. Um, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, that's that's you know that's the danger of of having the social media that we do now with these creators out there you know then you know from from our perspective you know you and I having started reading comics a long time ago right we didn't have that there if you if we found out any news about a comic it was 
by happenstance or, you know, you had to go really digging or you had to be subscribed to some, um, you know, newsletter that you actually received in the mail. So, yeah, yeah, that was now. So it's it's very I think it's somewhat dangerous for creators to get on there and just give off the cuff reactions to things. Yeah, and 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 then ha- the f- the furor that comes out of that. So anyway, well, I, I just think it's weird that people would be excited by that that whole you know statement. Anyway, I, I don't. To me, that I don't know. It just feels like that conversation has been had before. So I don't know why it would suddenly make everybody so excited. I, I'm not sure either. I mean, it just feels like those were conversations that were had back in the you know in the 80s and stuff. Uh-huh. You know, that, yeah. that, that that's been a conversation that's gone along for a, you know back in the Chris Claremont. Era yeah, of stuff. yeah, exactly. Are, are we are we just people or are we mutants? I mean, are we you know? Huh. So that is well, to me that's more in, to me it's more interesting that there be that kind of a crowd reaction to it than well, and it may be that just you know we get maybe these are younger readers that that haven't been exposed to the that older I'm stuff. Sure. And sure so is. so for them it, that's a new thing. Uh, yeah, they, they're not they're not perhaps uh, familiar with that that old um, conversation that was had back then. So all right. Well, that's Uncanny Avengers. Uh, it's okay, right? Or, or less than okay in your your opinion since you only got the first issue. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a comic that you did continue on, right, is Red She-Hulk. Yeah. I have to interject here because while Travis and I uh, were talking about the Marvel Now initiative and all of the titles associated with that, we also wanted to talk about the comic, the Marvel comics that we were reading now, you know, small N O W now, um, which includes the following comic that Travis and I will discuss. Back to the show. And so that mm-hmm. came out the same month as Uncanny Avengers. Uh, it was a rebranding from the Hulk title at that time and was right. rebranded as Red She Hulk, starting with number 58. And this is by. Uh, at least number 58 was by Jeff Parker and then two artists, Carlos, oh boy, Pagulayan, Pag, 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 I don't know. You want to try to pronounce that name, Travis? I don't either. I don't <laughs> clue. Pa- Pagulayan. I'm going to, I'm going to go with that. Uh, and Wellington Owls. Mm-hmm. So tell us about Red Shield because I did not read that one. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm really enjoying it. It's on the same. It's really. It's basically kind of the same overreaching story arc, even up to this point. Um, it, you know, the basic of the story is, is the government, a, a branch of the government, has decided that they should create their own. That they should redo the super um, soldier program and create these super beings because. Um, you know, obviously, with things like hulks running around and stuff like that, the government needs to be able to protect the country without having to rely on, you know, quote unquote, free agents, basically. Um, and in the process of them attempting to do that, Red She-Hulk comes in and just basically destroys everything that they're trying to do. And they can't figure out why. We get a, we, we find out in the storyline that um, um, Red She-Hulk has somehow come across this little girl who can who can. Um, foresee the future and she gives red she hulk a version of the future where these super soldiers basically take over the world and make the world a horribly miserable place so she is you know red she hulk is taking it upon herself without really telling anybody else what she's doing to try and stop this whole thing from happening Mm -hmm. and she doesn't think anybody will believe her so she is um um not telling anybody about it and gets herself tangled up with the avengers and and Ah. there's basically a giant Basically a giant manhunt, um, and the person that they send out initially to try and take control of her and gather information and find out what's going on is Machine Man. Um, huh. and, in the, and in the process of Machine Man um, gathering intel on her, he kind of um, takes her side in, in what's going on because there's this secret organization that's been around that's kind of potentially the forefathers of shield that have been around for forever and there's this supercomputer that's like in the center of the earth uh-huh um and um it it's what's it because it's a supercomputer it can extrapolate all this information and kind of predict the um 
the future or potential futures. And this little girl is actually just kind of a conduit. She somehow can tap into that. She's artistic, mm -hmm. but somehow she can tap into that. And, and Oracle. It's been stuff out. Right. And so that's kind of where the, the, you know, the book is at. It's actually really, I mean, the first couple issues were, you know, okay, kind of interesting. It's gotten really cool. The, the relationship between Machine Man and um, Red She-Hulk has just been a lot of fun. Um, the hunt for them has gotten a lot more serious. Um, uh, She-Hulk has just showed up and offering her services to um, help chase, chase down Red She-Hulk. <laughs> of course. Um, Red but... She-Hulk, Yeah. Red She Hulk has has discovered that, um, you know she's a, you know she's unlike the Hulk. She's in pretty much control of herself when she's being normal Red She Hulk. But she can actually go into this even more hulking stage where she really looks like a monster mm -hmm. and is totally not in control of herself. She, you know, maims and kills lots of military people in oh, the process wow. of one of these things. And and then and then so she has to kind of deal with. You know, she doesn't want to be in that headspace and she doesn't want to do this. I mean. She is a good person, but right now most people are seeing her as being an out of control Hulk that they need to just put down, kind of a thing. So it's been I, I've really enjoyed it. It's been a fun, it's been a fun romp. Wow, is that that I I want to go read that now based on that yeah. description. Yeah. When they when they like I said they bring up this kind of secret, you know, Uber computer kind of a thing. It it got that's when it really got interesting. It was like oh this is so much more than just you know her beaten up on a, another super soldier type program there's yeah. you know it was a lot more a lot more to it well yeah. and, and so that i i wonder if that has anything to do with it sounds really familiar to me i'm, I'm thinking maybe it has something to do with with hickman shield series from a few years back it, it, it may i i don't have that kind of i don't have that you know knowledge of that older stuff to you know oh, i wonder if parker is is tapping into some of that stuff but anyway um and yeah that and then the whole uh confrontation with you know the other so you know here you are you're this super powered person and you have this information that no one else has and so you're acting on that you don't think anybody's right. going to believe you and then obviously you're going to they're going to come after you because you're you're right. you're going you know you're doing things you shouldn't be doing so that that sounds mm. really interesting dang it i wish i would have picked that up now <laughs> I, I said I've, I've enjoyed it it's been a, it's been a a, a a fun read i so, have no idea you know what the sales are like on the book or whatnot and you know so why did you <laughs> decide to pick that up um you know I, I i don't know tons about the red she hulk character i was reading um uh, matt fraction's defenders and the character was in that all oh, right and, and she was just and she was kind of fun in that and i thought well you know what this is a you know marvel i don't think lots of times takes an honest stab at, at um trying to you know maintain female superhero books or at least not my experience so i thought i would give it a try to kind of support a female superhero book i like the female superhero books lots of times and this character was interesting and kind of fun so i thought well i'll just i'll jump on this and see what it's going to be like and uh -huh. you know is it going to be a fun read and whatnot and, and, and you know it pretty much has been so oh, okay good all right so those uh anything else to say about uh, either uncanny avengers or red she hulk travis nope all right, let's move on. Let's go to the second month of Marvel now, November 2012. Uh, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six books to talk about here. Let's start with all new X-Men. <laughs> and as I recall, Travis, when we talked about the Marvel Now announcement, and we oh talked God. about this particular comic, what did you say yep. about that? That it was ridiculous and absurd. First, it was absurd to call it all new X-Men because, of course, they're taking the X-Men 30 years ago I'm bringing them up so they can't be new they have to be the all old X-Men <laughs> like the dumbest thing ever I, you know, you know uh, what I still hate the title I mean I, yeah. I still hate the the what they've named the book because it's just to me that's still absurd but I hear the book is really I, I didn't get it I, I mean I absolutely wasn't going to get it because it just to me it just sounded dumb and like I said the title's stupid and whatnot but I hear nothing but great stuff about the book I, I, it's on the list of things to pick up as soon as it comes out and trade as opposed to hardback. I'll, I'll be getting it because everybody's talking about how it harkens back to the, you know, Chris Claremont stuff and, you know. Well, I don't know about but I'll that. But I'll let you talk about reading it. Yeah, because I, I did pick it up and, and actually I did. I came to it late. Um, I did not order it, pre-order it. Um, I just happened to, you know, within even within the first month that it came out, I was already hearing buzz from various, you know, various podcasts I listened to, other other things I, I was reading, and I'm like, really? 
this 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 concept that we you know you and I both kind of laughed at it's 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 garnering this kind of response I'm like okay well you know I'll check it out so I was at my comic shop in Spokane and they happen to have issue 1 I think actually both issue 1 and issue 2 at that time and the uh, book comes out like weekly okay <laughs> almost yeah well it's up to 10 issues already by the, by this record by the time of this recording right so all new x men uh, I read it. This is by Brian Michael Bendis, and uh, Stuart Immonen did the first five issues on art. David Marquez did has done six through eight, and Immonen is back on um, with nine and ten. So, all new X Men. So basically, the premise of this is that Hank McCoy, the 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 current Hank McCoy in in the current timeline, um, goes back in time and steals the original X Men and brings them into the present because he thinks that. They can somehow convince the Scott Summers of the Marvel now. Uh, get, see what I did there? Um, to to get him to stop doing what he's doing. And that's the premise. That is that is not the interesting thing about the comic because there's very little of the the old X Men inter, uh, interacting with either Scott. Uh, there there is in the last few issues, but. It's really just a bunch of talking. I, I'm going to say talking heads, but that's that's really not. It's not what you're seeing here. But it's really just people. These two people just kind of. This is my side of the story. This is your side of the story, and they just kind of talk at each other. Nothing really gets resolved here. What's interesting, the most interesting thing about this comic, Travis, um, is Kitty Pride and Jean Grey. Jean Grey, uh, in particular, you know, she she had some limited telepathic abilities. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, coming through time somehow, timey wimey stuff, I don't know, she suddenly has a lot more power. And she has taken on um, a kind of leadership role within her clique of X Men, which that's very interesting. Uh, and, and Scott, who was kind of the ersatz leader of, of that group, right, back then, right. Um, mm-hmm. because because of what he finds and, – and, and it's not like these characters come come to the future and don't know what's happened. They find out what's happened, what, what has happened, that Jean Grey died, uh, turned into the Phoenix and then died. Scott's done done this horrible thing recently mess, uh, yeah. from Avengers vs. X-Men, killing Professor X. You know, all this stuff, uh, Angel – found out what happened to him and he 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 freaks out and uh is basically saying i'm going back i don't care what you guys are doing i'm going back and then gene goes into his mind and calms him down and then convinces him that way that he should stick around mm. which wow <laughs> yeah and uh and and like i said scott because of all this stuff he he's kind of he's reeling from this revelation that he's this evil person now <laughs> is it total yes <laughs> and and so he's he's kind of divorcing himself from anything that's going on um you know to he doesn't know what to do and he, he it, and everybody hates him and so he's he's having a hard time dealing with it <laughs> but uh like i said uh gene gray's great uh, kitty is taking on Basically, the the Professor X role in this book. So she's she's the leader of these these this this young band of X Men, and uh, mm. just seeing her take on the reins of leadership like that is is really cool. Interesting. So um, yeah, I, I I think it's a it's one of the better book uh, Marvel books that I'm reading, uh, which like you know like you were saying about the the, the uh, kind of like the bad qualities based on the description. It's mm-hmm. it, it's working. It's it's amazing that it's working, but it's working. Huh. Uh, okay, so I think that's that's an I you know it's it's good. You you definitely should pick up the trade, um, yeah. and and decide for yourself. But uh, and then the Stuart Immonen art is is I think pretty good. Uh, no, well, it's not pretty good. I think it's it's really good. It's one of the better artists on on the Marvel book right now. So uh, that uh, I thought uh, very good book, and I'm going to continue with it for the foreseeable future. And and I like the way that it ties into um, Uncanny X Men. Uh, because I, I like the the only thing Travis about Avengers versus X Men that I liked was at the very end they start to examine what Scott did and how he feels about it, and 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 that second part only a tiny fraction. Uh-huh. And when I realized that that's what they were going to do here, 
in an all new X Men and Uncanny X Men. I really that's what drew me into those two books at mm-hmm. first was because I that's the only thing that I found interesting out of Avengers versus X Men. I want to see right. how Scott, the now Scott, is dealing with the fact that he killed his father. You know, the father figure that 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 sure. Xavier is right. Even uh-huh. if he was, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of. Uh, I'm jumping ahead now because that uncanny Avengers comes later or X Men comes later, but uh, he he's kind of uh, sidestepping the responsibility because he was, you know, possessed by the Phoenix Force. But really, you know, there's there's a question about is that true? Yeah. And uh, and so I'm really curious to see where that goes and how. Younger Scott and older Scott inter, interplay with each other, and anyway. So, uh, my only concern about this book is, you know, it seems like a limited concept, right? To some degree, my thought is, yeah. Because at some point, you know, I don't, you can't have. Well, I guess you can. You can, you can tell years and years of stories with these young X Men in this timeline, and then at, you know, when they decide, okay, we're going to drop this book, they just go back or something. I don't know, but it, it's it's a weird thing dealing with characters coming from the past into the present and how that affects everything so but it, it's working okay uh let's let's we're gonna go back and forth travis because you have you have three books that i'm not reading and i'm reading three books so let's uh let's go to thor god of thunder okay yeah um i'm not reading that one but you're not I, reading that one i wish i had based on what i'm hearing but yeah. you tell me yeah it's it's been really cool. And now, see, here's another character that um, I use Marvel now as an opportunity to jump onto a character that I have never read in solo title of whatsoever. But I thought, you know, I, I like Jer- Jason Aaron's uh, writing. I, I saw some preview art, and um, the preview art looked really cool. It's kind of a painted style kind of a thing. So I jumped on the book, and as I was surprised at, at how much um, – fun how interesting it's been you're basically dealing with um three three thors all at the same time in in a sense you've got this younger thor before he's really really truly the god of of um thunder he doesn't have his hammer yet kind of a thing he's kind of a young brash get into trouble kid really and and then you've got the thor from the current timeline and then you have thor as all father you know, he's the last of the Asgardians, um, all dealing with the fact that there's this um, uh, character who now I'm suddenly drawing a blank on his name, Gore, I think his name is, who is systematically going across the multiverses, killing all of anything that might be considered a god, any of the deities. I mean, on any abstract planet that's out there, if there is a god of, you know, um, mushrooms, He's he's slaughtering those gods. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, there you know, there's uh, you know, gods of of house cleaning. They get slaughtered. I mean, it just kills all these planets. These these um, gods are all being slaughtered. Wait, wait, wait. So, how would you like to live on a planet where there's a god of house cleaning? Well, I'm sure that probably on this planet, at one point or another, there was a god of house cleaning. Because <laughs> right. I'm vacuuming up after my kids going, oh, god of house cleaning, why can't you fix this for me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Go, go ahead. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but basically there's all all these different deities out there and um, um, somebody's wiping out entire pantheons. And um, uh, the very beginning of the book, it starts out where um, they've been in a battle or going to battle, something like that. Thor's down by the waterside with a bunch of other, you know, Vikings type things. And this head floats up. It's just a head. It looks like a Native American person, but it's just their head. And Thor recognizes them as being a as having been a deity and um, it's pretty disturbed by the fact that there's something out there that just took the head off of a, um, off of a, um, off of a God, basically um, he encounters this um, being that, you know, kind of tortures him and whatnot, but he manages to get free and hurt, hurt this, um, this God slayer. And so the God slayer kind of takes a personal to basically be a plague to Thor. And so the story is told from those three different perspectives the the old Thor has basically been dogged by um has been dogged by the Shadow Army for like five hundred years or something like that. They've slowly killed off all the other Asgardians and they've basically left Thor alive, trapped in in Asgard, 
as kind of a torture until the very end of whatever this guy has planned. And he's gone and, and just butchered pretty much all the other gods at some point or another. And um, I'm not describing it very well, but it's really interesting to see these different these different um, perspectives of Thor. And right now, as the, the latest issue, the current Thor and the All-Father Thor have gotten together at the end of time. And they are going to go and take out, they're going to go to this home planet of... Um, where gore is at and and hopefully defeat him and it's really funny the interaction between the current thor and this old thor because the current thor just can't wrap his head around the fact that he's his dad you know he becomes his dad i mean he's oh, basically yeah. the equivalent of, of odin i mean he's like <laughs> he's you know he's wearing this armor and he's like no that's the that's the all father's armor that that's not your armor you don't wear that armor no you don't understand for the last you know 400 years i i have been the all you know it's just is a fun conversation around the whole <laughs> and trying to wrap his head around that as they go. Cause now we're in the second arc, the second arc is called God, God bomb. And basically Gore is building some giant black sphere that is going to uh, annihilate er- everything, I guess, after that. Uh, and, and now there's start, there's starting to be hints at the fact that, you know, people have accused this, um, this Gore character of, well, aren't you a God yourself and treating people and, and being as powerful as you are and stuff. And they do give us they give us one issue of um, kind of a backstory of that character that he lives in this really horrible planet uh, where people you know pray to their gods and the gods don't do anything seemingly everybody dies anyway kind of a thing. He comes upon a scene of some spacefaring people. They may not even actually be gods, but they seem like gods to him because he's a simple you know stone weapon kind of a guy. And the gods these gods have crashed down to the planet that he's on, they're all injured and hurt and, and dying. And one of these, what he figures is a God asks him for help. And he's, he's lost his child. He's lost his wife. He's lost his mother. He's lost all these people. And every time they've prayed to gods and no one's helped them. And now here's this God having the nerve to ask him for help. And he loses it and basically finishes off this space varying guy and takes his, his weapons basically and starts on this journey to just I've killed these gods I can kill others. And uh, that's where he starts out on his hate for all gods. Yeah. Because obviously they, they don't really care about the people that supposedly worship them. So has, you mentioned that the modern Thor and future Thor interact. Does um, past Thor, does he interact with either of these other timeline it, Thors? No, ha- has not has not yet. Um, the the past Thor kind of sets up because he has he has the most conflicts with this God Killer early on the God Killer's um, life, also, and um, it kind of sets up the the young Thor sets up the um, the the animosity between the characters. Ah, okay, they both get each other at one point or another in a position where they can kind of torture and seriously maim the other one at, at one point or another. And so Thor thinks that he, uh, the young Thor th- thinks at one point that he has finished off this God killer. Uh, and then um, in current times, we find out that that's not the case. He just went into hiding and, and has been doing some other work and creating this other power source to come back and deal with them later. All right. But the art in it is outstanding. And I can't, I can't remember the artist's name. Uh, that's e- Isad Ribic. Yeah, it's just it's gorgeous stuff. I mean, as far as that kind of high fantasy looking type thing, mm-hmm. it's very cool. And there are seven issues out, and I, uh, I think you said this, but uh, issue seven starts the new storyline, the God yeah. Bomb arc, right? Bomb. Yeah, I may mm-hmm. have to go uh, buy that issue and see if I can pick up the the first six. I may have to add this mm-hmm. title to my pull list. It's 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 cool. I really I really I really had fun with it. It's been cool. cool yeah, talk. and I, and it's one of those things. I bought it on kind of a lark. Um, I didn't put it on my pull list. I actually went to the Shane store and 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 bought it because I'd seen some of the preview art on it and um, was surprised because I, you know, really don't have an interest in Thor in, in and of himself. Well, see, up and, until and, now. Yeah, and that's that's kind of where I was because I did get um, uh, Mighty Thor when that 
title mm-hmm. launched and I got the first six issues of that, which that was, you know, a fine enough story. I enjoyed it, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, knocking my socks off. So I dropped it. And then shortly after that, they did the whole Marvel relaunch. And, the, and so I see Thor, God of Thunder, I'm like, well, you know, that past series didn't really do it for me. Right. So why, why, why pick this up? And then <laughs> this is one of those times where it's like, wow, after hearing all the response and the positive response from the from the comic book reading community, I'm like, wow, I, I kind of missed out. It sounds like, so I'll try either try to get the issues, like I said, or I'll I'll, I'll definitely get the trade when it comes out. So, okay, uh, let's go to uh, FF. You're you're reading that one, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, and I I actually read a few issues and then I stopped it. So I uh, FF. This is by Matt Fraction. And art by uh, Mike Allred, which is a main reason why I decided to read those for a few issues. So it's up through issue six, but I stopped reading at issue three. And so uh, this is uh, I'll, I'll start off, Travis, and then you can you can catch uh, catch everybody up where I dropped off. But so this comes out of uh, the Fantastic Four title, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, the Fantastic Four go off into their year-long space dimensional travels, I guess, and decide that they need to have a Fantastic Four keep an eye on things and continue the future foundation stuff. And so they, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mr. Fantastic recruits uh, the current Ant-Man, whose name I can't uh-huh. remember. It's not coming to me. And uh, and then they, they recruit other people too. So they get, uh, is it Medusa? The, mm-hmm. the 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 girl with the the hair, yep. Uh, she Hulk, and a character they're calling Miss Thing, which is uh, Johnny Storm's replacement for him, who was uh, who was his the his girlfriend at the time. <laughs> She's like, how'd you like to be uh, a member of the Fantastic Four for what? What is it? What do they say? Four minutes? Four minutes. They're, they're gone minutes. for they're four minutes. They're only gone four minutes. So it's gonna be no big deal. <laughs> yeah. Four yeah. minutes. Just in case of that four minutes, you know, Galactus decides to attack. Right. Would you, my girlfriend, like to be my replacement on the Fantastic Four? <laughs> oh, it's such a crazy concept, but let's see. Uh, the only thing I liked about this, Travis, besides the Mike Allred art, and that, like I said, that's the primary reason I, I even got this, was the Ant-Man, the, the background for the Ant-Man character. You know, he his child died. Right. Right, and, and I'm, I'm I don't remember the details, but but he's going through that grief, and and uh, Mr. Fantastic tried is basically saying here is a way for you to deal with this, and uh, and so she, so Ant Man becomes the leader of the Future Foundation. You got all these characters from the the previous FF title that I did read the entire run of two years worth, I think it was, but and I enjoyed that to, for the most part, um, but. I mostly I, it wasn't that the FF was bad in any way. Uh, it was not keeping me interested enough to keep buying it. Uh, so there you go. That's go ahead. What what do you have to say about FF Travis? I just think it's a really. Uh, I mean, okay. So here I am again. I don't. I I own one Fantastic Four book, and it's from. Um, the very early 70s, basically, that I bought at a yard sale when I was a, a little kid. I've never really had an interest in the Fantastic Four, but with the whole Marvel now and then relaunching everything and whatnot, I figured I would, that'd be a time to jump on. And so I give both these a shot. I, FF, I was going to jump on to because of the Mike Allen art, it just looked, it kind of looked bonkers, you know, the covers that we'd seen and stuff. So I was like, okay, uh, you know, I'll give this a few issues to see what it is. So I got it. I really like the book because it's quirky. Uh-huh. I think Matt Fraction does quirky really well. You know, I, I, the recruiting of people I, th- I thought was was amusing. Each person's why they chose the people they chose and stuff. I, I thought was um, pretty funny um, and somewhat ridiculous with you know Johnny picking the um, you know his his girlfriend, his pop singer girlfriend to be um, you know to be the um, the you know the fourth member of the group mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, uh, the kids. The kids are lots of fun. I, I think I, to me, it's just a really fun comic. I don't take it. I don't take it real serious. It has kind of fun moments in it. Um, 
I can't remember what issue some of the stuff happens in. The Times Square stuff that happens, I thought was really some really great moments there. They, they're some paparazzis have come in to take pictures, and it's actually the what's the gang called? It's the Yancey Street Gang. Oh yeah. Take take pictures because they want to discredit the FF because um, they're not the real Fantastic Four, <laughs> you know, and it's not the thing, so they're going to discredit. They take some they take some potentially risque pictures of of um, Deirdre, and that's the Miss Thing character, and um, and Ant Man together. So they chase after them, and they end up down in New York Times Square, and there's some great, I thought, some great shots there. There's a funny issue where um, She-Hulk goes out on a date, and the uh, Moloids, is that what they're called? Uh-huh. The, they're, you know, they all look the same. One of them is a floating head in a jar. They've got a thing for um, oh, yes. the Jen, the Jen, as they yes. call her. They, <laughs> they've, they got, they've got a major crush on her. So they attempt to... Um, they attempt to to make the date worse, and they get oh, what's the clone's name? I can't remember what the kid's name is. It's a clone of like the Weathermaster or whatever the heck his name is. Yeah, so um, they get him because he's supposedly you know an evil mastermind himself. This little kid, they get him to help them screw up the date, and in the process of that, it all goes wrong, and they end up making the date just like ten times better. You know, they do all this different stuff. And it's just funny. And uh, to me, it's just a, it's a comic I love reading because whereas so many of the comics you read have these like serious, heavy consequences that are just dire. This one doesn't seem to really have that. It's just a fun romp. And the art just adds to that, kind of gives it this kind of very bright, but still kind of a silver age, just kind of a rompy feel to it. And, and that's why I've been enjoying it because it's just a fun comic. I don't think it's the master. Is well, I don't wizard? know who, who, wizard, right? Is that what it is? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, no. it's a clone. Bentley, uh, this, Bentley twenty three. It's a clone of the wizard. Right. Yeah. Just, just disclaimer. I, like I said, I don't really know these characters. I know, I know one of the kids, Alec, from Power Pack. I know him because way back in the day when Power Pack came out, I collected Power Pack. Mm-hmm. That's the only character in that that I really know, other than I know you know most of them by name, but I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue what, what is a dragon man. That's like kind of the babysitter. I have no idea who that character is. Yeah, I, I don't really know who the Moloids are, other than the, the <laughs> Moloids, and they're funny. You well, know, okay. so uh, there's there's two of the other three kids in that group that yeah. I don't really know who they are per se. But yeah. well, that was the the kids were. And the, these are all kids. That these these characters were all from the previous run of FF, and right. they they were probably some of the best parts of that comic, especially yeah. the Moloids. I love the Moloids. <laughs> and, and, and as I say, there are some serious parts of the book. I don't want to make it sound like it's just a big goofy thing that there's no consequences or anything. I mean, this 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 Johnny Storm from the far far future. Oh uh, yeah, I wanted I wanted to ask you about that. So go ahead. So he's a psycho basket case. If he even really is the real giant Johnny Storm, I mean, he's missing an eye. He's he you know supposedly this um, creation in the future is like a it's like a it's like if you took like Doctor Doom and like three other of um, Fantastic Four's biggest nemesis, nemesis and they made themselves into one entity, is out there somewhere just destroying everything, and so they've got to yeah. figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. So they decide they're going to they're, they decide they're gonna go, Ant-Man decides they're going to go and do in Dr. Doom. They're going to they're gonna take him out. Not arrest him, they're going to kill him. <laughs> and he goes to the and wow. he goes to the Future Foundation, all the kids, and goes, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is our job. This is job number one. To keep this horrible, because all the rest of the Fantastic Four is supposedly dead. To keep this all this horrible stuff from happening, we're gonna go and, you know, kill Doctor Doom. And the the Future Foundation, the kids are like, uh, okay, you know, they've all been tasked because they're all kind of you know smart kids. They've all been tasked with trying to figure this out. And Alec, I think he's the older oldest of them, is like, wait a second, that's not what the Future Foundation is about. Mm-hmm. We're, we're not about doing this stuff. And and. And Ant-Man's like, well, what would you have me do then? Because if we don't do something, this is what's going to happen. So they're kind of left with that. Another chaos ensues. And during that, Alec kind of takes off. And he's now, the last place we saw him at, he's knocking on the gates of basically Doom's house. <laughs> saying, hey, we've got we to gotta find a better way to fix this problem. Wow. Also, the other thing that's going on is Bentley 
Medusa has been coming to him, and I'm not sure it's really Medusa, but it's just because she, when she talks, when it, when she, she comes to him at night, and when she talks, her word bubbles are kind of a kind of a purple violet color. So I'm not 100 percent sure it's really her, if he's dreaming or what the deal is, and she's been like coaxing coaxing him back into being a bad guy as mm-hmm. opposed to the good guy they're trying to make him out to be. And the last issue that we're the last surprise we get is he's woken up and his dad is there, Medusa is there, and they're like, now it's time for us to, you know, unleash our plan. So there are some serious things going on amongst this kind of fun, quirky stuff. So it's not like it's all just, you know, goofy with no consequences. But I I buy said I've just been it's just been a kind of a fun romp. Uh sounds like I had dropped it far too soon. Right about the time things started really yeah. picking up and doing something. I have to admit the first couple issues, you kind of go, yeah, okay. Other than the kind of fun art, what's the point of this? Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly why I dropped it. And all of a sudden the point, you know, kicks it, all that, you know, these plots really just kick in and start happening. Now, see, my usual thing is to, uh, uh, to give a title at least six issues, right? But unless it's really, really bad. Mm-hmm. And I've already decided it's 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 not worth paying that extra two uh, three to four dollars um, to to get up to six issues. And and it was but this that's FF wasn't like that. It was just the first couple issues were like eh, yeah, it wasn't yeah. impressing me. And I was buying I'm buying too many comics, so I'm I'm really looking at how I can I you. reduce you know my my exp- expenditures here. So and that was one of them, despite the fact, like I said, I really enjoy Mike Allred's art. So, but right. but again, it sounds like I. <laughs> and the funny thing about this, Travis, is that I get this title through my uh, comic shop in Spokane, and they've been even though I've asked them to to remove that title from my list, I've still been getting issues. I got four, five, and six in my box. Uh, I could have I could have bought them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I didn't. Okay, yeah, that sounds like fun. All right, uh, let's go. Since we're talking about Fantastic Four, let's go to Fantastic Four proper. Ugh. This is uh, this is not a title I read, so you're going to have to do all the talking again. Um, oh Fantastic Four is up to issue seven. This is by Matt Fraction again, with art by Mark Bagley, which is a big reason why I decided not to pick this up. Yeah, I hear you. And then that was the thing. That was the first thing that thought. I'm like, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to. I, I thought, you know, everybody talks about how great Fantastic Four is, you know, that it's, you know, this. Well, obviously, it's an iconic Marvel imprint, right? I mean, you know, um, characters. They've well, been around for forever. Yeah, and 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 the whole Jonathan Hickman run, which I have all in trade, uh, up mm-hmm. through. I, I actually got so I got the trades, and then I, I I started getting it monthly from issue 600 until it ended. And mm-hmm. what if what a great story. Great, yeah. great story. So great, so, fantastic so I, four comics. You know, so I thought, you know, this is the time. This is the time. Yeah, uh-huh. I mean, you know, I, you know, I pick on Marvel or whatever. This is the time for me to jump on the book and and see what it's about. See if I can get into this um, something I've just never really had an interest in. But I thought, you know, this is the time I'll give it a shot. I I like a lot of what Matt Fraction does, so I'll, I'll jump on for that. The Bagley art I was a bit concerned about because I really did not enjoy it at all when he was doing, um, you know, Justice League there for a while Mm -hmm. so i was like "Eh, yeah but i'll get we'll get it and see it's serviceable i don't like his art but it's serviceable is why i figured so you know okay as long as the story's gonna be fine uh, i'll be happy with it i tell you get the first issue and the best description i can have for it some of the other people that i talked to about comics i I, you know I'll, i'll use their description it was kind of like a setup for the fantastic four does the magic school bus (laughs) <laughs> if you're familiar, if you're familiar yeah, with that yeah. series of books. Yeah. Because what they're going to do is they're all going to gather up and go on this adventure, and they're going to go through other dimensions and other times. The family, the family, you know, the kids plus the Fantastic Four, they go off on this ad- adventure. They're only going to be gone for four minutes in our reality, but they'd be gone for a year, a year long vacation in their reality. And it'd be this teaching experience for their kids, and it'd be all great and whatever. Yeah. Of course, the, which, the behind which, the scenes. Which is a which is a concept. Sorry for interrupting, but which is a concept that actually I wanted to read. Go on. Yeah. Well, I was fine with that idea, I, I guess, until I started seeing the execution of it. Uh-huh. And, and behind the scenes, the behind the scenes problem is is Reed Richards is falling apart at a cellular level. Right. He, he's discovered that his elasticity, he's breaking down, and he he figures it's only a matter of time before 
because of what he was exposed to to give him his powers and to give the rest of the Fantastic Four their powers, he figures that it's going to happen to all of them at some point. And he's dying, basically, falling apart, and he doesn't immediately have a cure. So he thinks he needs to go someplace out there in the multi-dimension, multi-time, verse, whatever. That's where he's going to discover this thing that's going to fix him from. So he's hiding, going and searching for to fix his problem under this guise of let's go on this great you know, educational vacation. It'll be a lot of fun. We'll have more family time. It'll be great. And his family so, doesn't know this, right? No, they do not. Well, they do now. Oh, they do now. Well, okay. Sue knows. Sue, Sue knows. See, and but, and that's that's another aspect of this story. You know, I knew that, that this was happening to Reed in this this relaunch, and I, I just eventually I knew that Sue would find out, and and I really wanted to see that that interaction between those two characters. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, it's not it's not good. I I'm not. I, I am not. I'm dropping the book. Oh, okay. I've got up till I've got up till now. I I pre-ordered it, so I'll get a couple more issues. But it's it was. Yeah, I'm 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 not enjoying the book enough to continue to continue to get it. I'm I'm kind of in the same boat as you, is that I I consume too many comic books and something needs to go, and I've decided this is one of the ones that's going to go. Okay. Uh, but um, you know, so they go off on these ad- adventures, and you know, they 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 meet a version of which is one of the things that actually is kind of interesting. They they go to where Caesar is being killed, a timeline where Caesar is being killed. They find out that Caesar isn't really Caesar. He's some other alien life form that's, that took over Caesar's body long before that. This was an alien traveler who also went to go see Caesar being killed because it's so, you know an important, you know, a significant event. But Caesar dies before the before he gets stabbed by Brutus and everybody else. So he takes over being this. The Fantastic Four kind of save him, and so this character is in the current timeline and is now. The current timeline in Earth, and is going to be doing something, which they haven't talked more about that. But that part was kind of maybe interesting. The whole thing was Sue finding out about the fact that that Reed is falling apart. It was kind of like a "How dare you not tell me? I'm not talking to you." And then she goes and sorts socks. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. There is one. There was one issue. I can't remember if it was like issue four. Maybe it was five. There was kind of a sweet issue. They go to this planet, you know, new alien race. They're there. They're talking to the dignitaries. They're all, the dignitaries are all excited to see them because they've heard of humans before and whatnot. They go to this cave, and there's these ancient cave paintings, and the ancient cave paintings are of basically the Fantastic Four and mostly of of Sue. You uh-huh. know, she's basically she's basically painted like this giant goddess figure. So of course they're all really impressed with Sue because she is. This goddess figure that supposedly, obviously, they had oracles way back then that told about her. Well, you come to find out that in reality, um, Riches was having a moment where he was just, you know, remembering how much he loves Sue and whatnot. And he actually travels. He actually sneaks off, travels through time, and goes and paints this giant cave painting back in ancient times. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, so he pretty much – I mean, it's sweet. It was a sweet story, and it was written very well for a sweet story. But, But, yeah, he basically screwed with these people. Inadvertently, I mean, it really wasn't his intention, but that's what ended up happening. It was a sweet story, but there's just not enough there for me to. Um, it's just bland. It's just really kind of a dull book for me. Um, so how, this, how do you reconcile that with? So because Fantastic Four and FF are both written by Matt Fraction. I know, and everybody's like, oh, you know, because I mean, the community of other people I talk to are all kind of like in the same kind of the same where I'm at. Some of them are liking Fantastic Four more because it is getting more exciting. The last issue was much more exciting, but I've already decided I'm, I'm I, you know, that I'm done with the book. Yeah. Yeah. Even, if it, even if it suddenly gets really exciting. How do I reconcile it to you? I reconcile it in this way, in that Matt Fraction, I think, is very good at writing his thing. You know, quirky kind of stuff and and you know, stuff where it's kind of off the beaten path and, it, and, is, and, is, and is trying to tell something in a different fashion. Whereas, and so FF works because he's just kind of this kind of, this crazy ride, just like his... Casanova stuff is and some of the other stuff that he's written. It's kind of this kind of crazy ride. Yeah. Whereas and Hawkeye, we'll, we'll talk mm-hmm. a little about that mm-hmm. too, obviously. Where, but whereas Fantastic Four, it's like he, he he's trying to write something straight, I think. And I'm, I'm not enjoying it. But I've not enjoyed anything that he's written, I don't think, where he's just written it straight. 
And that's nothing against the guy. I mean, I like the guy, and I like, like I said, the quirky stuff he writes. I love. But I think when he writes straight up superheroes with a straightforward well, and uh, story, uh, say corporate superheroes, you okay, because Fantastic right. Four is a brand, right? Right. Whereas FF that, is not. All right. Okay. Fair enough. If that's the if that's what it is, that's then, that's then, how that, I look at it anyway. That that's not enjoyable yeah. for me. That's not enjoyable because it's just it's just it's mediocre and bland. So. So basically what you're saying is that Matt Fraction needs to go off and do more creator-owned work. Yes. Uh, uh, 100% agree. <laughs> he just needs to put out more Casanova, and I'll be tickled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, his Hawkeye rocks, too. I mean, oh, yeah. We'll later, but, yep. you know, so if he's given the room to do something different, I think he does great stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, if he's just toeing the line, it feels like we're toeing the line. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. That's where I am with that. Cool. All righty. Let's, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, and Indestructible Hulk is, is the next on the list here. Uh, we're up to issue six on that. This is by Mark Wade. Uh, the first story arc, issues one through five, the art was bun, uh, bun was done by Laniel Yu. And now we're getting into, I believe it's a three-part story with Walt Simonson doing the art. And I just reviewed that on um, uh, my comics review on YouTube. Uh, so... Uh, this is this is not one you're reading, right, Travis? Or are you? No, I, I'm not. I, okay. I, I I don't know. I decided I wasn't interested in the Hulk, yeah. despite what well, Wade did. Yeah, yeah. So I would not normally have gotten this, except the, for the fact that Mark Wade was writing it. And so uh, for those that may not know or, or perhaps have forgotten, so Mark Wade's basically his pitch line for this series was uh, Hulk smash banner builds. And so there's a lot of i mean hulk is in it of course but there's a lot of focus on bruce banner being the uber scientist that he is and uh in many ways um he's portrayed as even even uh you know smarter and more imaginative than tony stark as a scientist uh, uh even mr fantastic um who 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 are some other uber scientists in the marvel universe but but uh he uh banner is he's got he's got like you know a dozen new ideas that will change the world before lunch. I mean, that's kind of how they're portraying him. And to help fund that, uh, Banner makes a deal with S.H.I.E.L.D., basically saying, you set me up with whatever I need to produce these things, these ideas, give me a small team, and you'll benefit from this, the world will benefit from this, and in return, you get to use the Hulk as a weapon. You point him in the direction you want him to go, and that will happen. And so that's that's what ha- that's the setup. And so far, it's uh, it's been a very interesting book. In in that, um, Laniel Yu's art is fantastic. Uh, he, he, the guy is just incredible with what he does. I, I I hope that he returns to the book after the Simonson arc. Um, but I don't believe he does. I, if I remember correctly, somebody else is doing because what happens after the Simonson Thor thing, uh, they're going to do a Hulk Daredevil team up, mm. which I don't, you know I don't, I don't know how that's going to work out. Hulk that's, and that's Daredevil. A, that's an interesting combination. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, so, I mean, Wade, Wade's writing both of those books, so right. Uh, and uh, let's see, what else can I say about this? Uh, this is actually I was actually going to drop this book after the first story arc, and but I wasn't paying attention and I pre-ordered <laughs> the Simons and stuff. Uh, so I'm sticking around for that. And then I found out, okay, well, Daredevil's there, so I'm going to stick stick around for that. Where Daredevil works for me, written by Mark Wade in so many ways, um, Hulk is okay. Uh, I, I really like the setup. I like the idea. I like the focus on Banner as opposed to the Hulk because the Hulk has never interested me as, as a superhero. Mm-hmm. I've I've read some Hulk comics over the years, and I just I I just don't care about a uh, mindless, super strong, super indestructible creature. Uh, it just doesn't right. make does doesn't make interesting stories to me. It's always been about Banner, and Banner is usually not the focus of the Hulk comics. So I appreciate the fact that Mark Wade is doing that now. Uh, the only drawback to that is that I don't think we're not seeing enough of that in here because you know you gotta. <laughs> You got to have the Hulk in here, right? Because it's the Hulk comic, right? So that's unfortunate, but um, uh, it, it, it I've, again, it's it's a great setup, and uh, if you like that kind of thing, you should probably check it out. 
Um, what else does? Oh, there, I remember when we talked first talked about this, Travis. When uh, we saw that first preview image from Joe Casada, he's wearing armor. He's wearing armor. <laughs> yeah. See, that's another thing. I was just gonna say that that's another <laughs> thing that put me off immediately was is that's just you know. First off, I didn't. I, I think the the name change is kind of silly too. But um, but then putting him in armor, he's the Hulk. Come yeah. on. Well, they, they do. Why is he wearing armor? Yeah, there is a reason for why he's wearing the armor. Oh, it's, I'm sure they came up with it's something. It's but. supposed to help control the Hulk, and and also it it record. I guess. It, oh no, there's that the, the robot that follows him around and 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 that gives him a bunch of armor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They could have put an earbud in his ear and it done the same thing basically. <laughs> I know it's it's kind of. Oh, oh, dang it! I forgot to say something else about Fantastic Four, but that's okay. Okay, well, I, I'm I'm done with Hulk. So what? what... My, this is the real reason for me dropping, also for dropping Fantastic Four. And and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I don't like I said I don't know these characters. But on Fantastic Four, so I didn't know anything about the the two kids. Their powers I have no idea what they can or can't do. You know, because they're just basically oh the, all these issues. Reed and Sue's children. Right. They, oh wow. Yeah. I don't. I don't know anything about them. Wow. And and so far they've just been kids. They've just been kids. They're obviously smart. You know, along for a ride on this adventure. The last issue I read, horrible stuff happens. The ship gets torn apart and stuff. And at the very end of it, they're like they they're at the beginning of time in this situation they're in, and they have to, for numerous reasons, they're going to go to basically to the end of time, and. In the comic, the son goes, I can do it. And they're like, whoa, I don't know. That may be a little too much for you. He goes, no, no, I, I can do it. And he literally winks them out of the beginning of time to the end of time. Yeah. And I'm like, so I get on Twitter, because that's where all you people at that know all this stuff. And I go, okay, I don't know anything <laughs> about this kid's powers. What's the deal here? And I basically get a bunch of versions of what he can do. But basically, it falls under, well, he's equivalent of a god. Yeah. You know, he can pretty much, well, this whole storyline is stupid then. Because why the hell don't they just go, hey, son, I'm falling apart on a cellular level. Why don't you help put me back together again? Oh, okay, Dad. Done. Let's move on. Yeah. Dumb. Dumb. That just blows fi- me finding that out. Just compl- I mean, you know, granted, maybe he doesn't have complete control of his powers, blah, 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 blah. But you'd think he'd be using your best tool to help you figure it out, and they're not. And so to me, it just like – it makes this whole thing just as stupid as stupid could be. I mean I understand part of the whole idea is it's supposed to be family time too, but it shouldn't be family time when Reed Richards is having to wear a thing on his arm because his arm is falling apart. So I just – to me that just like that, okay, that's stupid. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what you what you don't know is that in the, in the, uh, the previous FF series – uh, that there was a lot of focus on the son and daughter, and yes, they together, those two can pretty much do anything, because the daughter is even s- super smarter right. than Reed Richards, and she's what, four, six, something like that. She's older than that now. Is she but, okay? Yeah. Well, when I was, I, th- I think when she was not much older than six, for, but I, you know, my memory sucks. So, and 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 the son uh, created his own universe in his closet. Yeah, see, that's ridiculous. So <laughs> you put those two together and they can do anything. So, yeah, you're right. The the, the whole premise kind of falls apart, right? Yep. Yep. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. That. I don't know, that's what just put me over the edge of that book. All right. And I just remember. All right. Last uh, last title that came out in November, uh, Captain America by Rick mm. Remender and uh, John Romita Jr. And they're up to issue six on that. I did not pick this up because, like the Hulk... Um, Captain America never has really interested me, and more importantly, um, I cannot stand John Romita Jr.'s art these days. Yep. I just, I just can't. I, I, I won't buy it because I just don't like it. So, <laughs> but you're reading this. Yes, I am. And I had I, enough people. I had enough people talk to me about this book and yeah. that, how it was kind of a uh, a sci-fi book. Really, yeah. is really what it was. Yeah. I, I the buzz I've been hearing is this is a this is a crazy Captain America story in another dimension, and there's weird stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, eh, Captain America. I just, I, I mean, I could we could spend an hour <laughs> me talking about uh, the things that kind of, you know, worry me about Captain America as a character. It's just a little too patriotic for me, or that's that's my sense of the character. I've never collected Captain America. I'll say it right up front. Uh, and and I got nothing against being patriotic. It's just it always my image in my head of him is is over the top, and so I don't. I mean, to the point I haven't even seen the Captain America movie because I just can't. Oh really? I have a hard time. 
Yeah, which I should, but I just can't get my brain to shift past that. So I was like, yeah, I'm not getting Captain America's out. But then people started talking about it, how he's in this other dimension. It's this survival story. It's this sci-fi story. I thought, well, this might be the time to see what it's about. So I went back and, and I didn't start reading the book until issue three, but I went back and got one and two and started reading them. And it's crazy. It's crazy cool. And, you know, I do not like, I haven't liked, you know, Ravana Jr.'s work since, you know, back in the old days when the New Mutants first started out and he was on that book. I didn't, I, I mind, I didn't mind him then, but I have not been a fan. I'm not, a, I mean, I'm still not a fan, but the story is just nuts enough that I can look past the art to have a good time with it. It's just, I mean, um, I can't remember the villain's name. It starts with a Z or something like that. Zola. Zola. Yeah. He gets in, if Captain America gets infected with this, um, this Zola virus. And he ends up getting a version of Zolop in his own chest. So for years, and, and a lot of time passes in this in these six issues, like 12 years pass in this six issues. Well, and, and then there's this kid involved, too, where the, the kid He's ages father, rapidly, right? Basically. Right. Well, no, the kid doesn't age rapidly. He's been there for 12 years. He oh, snatches okay. the kid up as a baby, thinking that Zolop is torturing this child, snatches the kid up, um, saves the kid. You know, and then in a comic, a year goes by, you know, he's okay. got this toddler and then it, and then like 11 years go by. And he's got this 12 year old with him that he's this entire time has been teaching and educating. The kid's name is Ian. He calls Captain America dad. Captain America for like years has fought with this this television on his chest that nobody else really knows about that talks to him. It's constantly nagging at his brain. It's trying to make him give up, go evil, turn himself in, kill himself, just constantly blah, blah, blah. Jeez. You know? So anytime he's unconscious, he's asleep, he's hurt, or anything like that, he's just constantly being badgered by this thing in his chest. Um, it's just crazy and kind of cool. And so, um, and you got this new character named Jet that is the daughter of Zoloff, and he's raised the daughter as, uh, basically telling him that there's this evil scum out there called Captain America in his universe, that stole their child and killed the child and all this stuff. And so the last couple books, they've had this you know big fight, and they've discovered that the kid is still alive. That actually Captain America, the daughter's like, well, wait a second, this guy can't be that evil. You know, look, there's my brother. He looks healthy. He looks fine. You know, and he and he's saying that this guy helped him, not you know tried killing him or anything. So it's it's. You know, and, and Captain America has kind of led a quasi rebellion. They've kind of been hiding, but there's this group of creatures that um, Zoloff has created in his universe that don't like being treated basically as slaves or or food for whatever the other bigger monsters are. So Captain America has kind of been with them and has kind of not really 100% let a revolt, but kind of. And he's gotten most of them killed in the process of this let's stand up for our rights kind of thing. But it's been kind of exciting. I don't know that I'll keep collecting the book after he gets back because obviously at some point he's going to get back to his own, you know, back to the regular world. But it's been interesting as a, as a sci-fi kind of craziness kind of thing. Yeah. But I also know Captain America fans who don't like it because they feel like Captain America's weak, you know, in this book, he's not the, the strong tactician, you know, kind of triumphing guy that he is in the, he, that he has been in the past. Mm -hmm. But I, so I was, so one one of the things you just brought up was, uh, you know, eventually they'll he'll most likely return from whatever dimension he's in, right? So one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, and I think this is a good place to do it, is there doesn't seem to be any continuity in Marvel Comics these days. And Captain America is a, is a good example because he's supposed to supposedly off in this other dimension, right? But yet but he's he's, always... he's in every Avengers book. So when when does this th when does this thing happen in Captain America the the, the his own series when did, does it happen before this does it happen after it and and there's a lot of that going around in terms of you know what's happening in the Avengers books and and other all and you know, and these cosmic events that are happening at the same time that say Age of Ultron is happening um, where the world is basically destroyed by Ultron, but, but, you know, Brian Michael Bendis is saying, this is now, this is in continuity. And I'm, and I'm looking at, looking at the Marvel universe as a whole, based on what I'm reading and, and what I'm reading about and going, what the heck? Where, 
<laughs> where is everything? How's it working? And and I basically my conclusion is, I think Marvel just says we don't care about that. We're just trying to tell good stories about these characters in these situations. You know, continuity be damned for the most part. What what do you think about that? I that's yeah, well okay. Here's the thing is is I don't read most of those team books that I think are their their big books. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the Avenger books, and the X-Men books, which there's what, you know, 20 or so between the two of them. Um, aren't those like their main books? Those are the bread and butter books. I, I'm assuming that those books are, are somehow all staying on kind of the same path. And, and then there's all these other, you know, um, these few individual books where they're kind of doing their own thing. But yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it's their version of a, you know, they said they weren't rebooting or, re, you know, whatever. And this, But this isn't this kind of their version of that where they just don't care what happened before or, or the, if anything matches up and stuff. And then the other question is, does, does that matter? Does yeah. that, for me right now, it doesn't matter. I don't, it's been so long since my brain has been in the Marvel universe that with me picking up the books I'm picking up, I, I don't have an issue because I'm not picking up some of those I mean, Grant, if I thought about it, okay, I know Captain America's in all these other books. How does this work when he's in this Dimension Z for, you know, he's been there for a decade now. Well, obviously, you know, you know it's going to be that time moves differently there or something. Right. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but how do they reconcile the two when he does come back? I have no idea. I don't think it's that big of a deal as long as the internal consistency of a particular title is maintained. Right. right. Does it have to relate to everything? Uh, else going on no but i marvel has maybe not marvel but perhaps marvel fandom has long since or, or for a long time now i think and this is coming from a guy who doesn't has not read a lot of marvel comics in in past years but uh that was kind of a a selling point that they would present that the marvel universe is more cohesive in right. many ways than say dc's universe yeah, but it's not. And so, and uh, it just seems like now that's not the case. And uh, you know, for good or bad, it just depends on your perspective whether you think that it should be like that or, or you know, you don't care because what you're getting are good stories. I just, mm -hmm. I found it interesting um, the 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 status of the Marvel universe right now. Yeah, well, it's it's a good observation, and you're you're probably right. I like I guess I don't I don't read enough of those some of those other big books to know. To, to know for sure, but obviously the, the books that I read don't. Um, the rest of the universe doesn't seem to matter. It, it, you know, it doesn't. It's not like they have. It has any. It, it doesn't seem to have any weight on what's going on. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? The Thor book. It doesn't seem to have any. You know what he's doing there has no relevance to what's going on. Anything else? It doesn't seem. And you know, all these books are, are, that I read are that way. It doesn't seem to be. So, so in Captain America, uh, does what? What's the headgear that Cap wears in that title? Nothing it, now. Oh, nothing. Well, okay, so what did he start? He's, did, he's, got a, he's got a beard and long hair. He had the helmet, I think. The, okay, that's that's why I was asking because the, um, Cap is drawn differently in in different books. So sometimes oh. he wears that helmet looking thing, and sometimes he just wears the. You know the, the 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 traditional mask that he has. So. Yeah, I think he had the helmet-looking thing, but I don't remember because he he didn't wear it for very long, kind of thing. I mean, the the beginning of the book is is a couple pages of him talking to I think who somebody is supposed to be like his girlfriend, or somebody he's attempting to have a relationship with. Sharon. Yeah, he gets on a train. He gets on a subway train because they know this subway train has some weird stuff about it, and they know it goes someplace. So they're sending Captain America in undercover to um to see what it really is and actually the tra the subway train actually moves through dimensions and it pops him into this other dimension and as it pops him through he basically almost immediately gets um attacked and gets held captive and and you know um Zilov is basically kind of experimenting on him and torturing him and then he breaks free so he doesn't i don't think he really has the helmet for very long it doesn't mm. seem like okay I, I can't picture him in my head having the helmet. Um, just so as, still, yeah. Just as an aside, I, I really wish they'd get rid of that stupid helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that helmet. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's go on to the next month. 
uh, December of 2012. Uh, I only have two books here between us. And uh, first up is Avengers, the Avengers title, uh, by Jonathan Hickman. And art by three different people, depending on the issues. Jerome Pena started it out through issue three. Adam Kubert did uh, another three issues. And Dustin Weaver is, is doing another three issues. Um, so there are nine issues out. Uh, is this, this is not one you read, right, Travis? I, I picked up the first issue and then decided that the story might be interesting, um, but I didn't want to pay the cover price for it, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I hear Hickman writes long stories, yes. so I thought, well, I'll just – this will probably be in, really enjoyable in a trade. Yes. So it's one of those things I, I, I fully intend on reading it, but didn't feel the necessity to have to pick it up month to month, so I will be getting it on trade. Yeah, yeah, and I, I fully recommend that too. Um, uh, because of Hickman's work on S.H.I.E.L.D. and Fantastic Four um, – not to mention his independent stuff that I've read, but uh, he's he tells an interesting story. He's got big ideas, and uh, they're <laughs> they're really interesting. So I picked that up, and Avengers is like um, basically there's a, there's a conversation between Tony Stark and Cap uh, before or after he either goes to or returns from that dimension in his own title, um, <laughs> where they decide that the Avengers needs to be bigger. It's got to be a bigger thing. To, to deal with with you know bigger things that have that keep coming up so they start recruiting a bunch of people and basically any, any, anybody and everybody is an Avenger right <laughs> or can mm-hmm. be um, so that's kind of how it started out but then then there's this uh, and the way that Hickman tells a story and and I've I've heard a complaint recently about Hickman um, which I, I can see where he there and and it's kind of it kind of runs counter to what I've been saying in some of my reviews recently, where you know character is really important to me, as opposed to say you know plot over character, right? Well, right, Hickman right. is very much he's an idea guy, and his characterization there while there is some there, um, it's definitely secondary to the big story ideas that he has, and so essentially. The Avengers, the Avenger characters are just there to further the plot and this this big story idea along. So it doesn't really matter who's there. Um, but I will say that there were a couple issues where the focus was on one particular character. So the first one I did was the Hyperion character, which is essentially the Superman-like character. Right. Character right. in the Marvel Universe, or one of them anyway. And then they did one where there's this new female smasher character who becomes part of the, the, the elite Kree guard. But she's human. And it tells her story, which both of those stories were really, really good and very much a character-oriented piece. But then you, you look at the whole of the Avengers, and there's this uh, these, these cosmic-like creatures, Ex Nihilo and Abyss, who who are on Mars, and and that's kind of how this the, this this first story arc starts out. It's like, oh, there's this thing happening that that started on Mars. So all the Avengers go to Mars, and I have to admit, I was kind of lost at first in this uh-huh. story. Um, but essentially, it is the these these cosmic creatures come to basically are affecting Earth from Mars, and there's this whole fight between them, and uh, they're essentially looking at Earth as as this, uh, like it, the next step of evolution is going to happen here, and so that's why they're there, and they're affecting that evolution. And there's this thing called the white event in the current storyline that's that's happening. Um, and so there, so something big is happening here, and Earth is in the middle of it, and the Avengers are in the middle of that. So uh, it's like I said, big ideas, uh, good art. I really like the art on this, especially the the initial one from Opinia. Um, I didn't, you know, I honestly did not even realize that Adam Kubert did the art on that second set of issues, mm. uh, which I, it says a lot, I think, about probably who was inking him, because I can usually tell Kubert's art right off, and I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the Kubert's, uh, the Kubert brothers. So anyway, and Dustin Weaver is, is doing it, but I I've, I think I've only read one issue of that, and um, I'm looking at my desk and I don't see one. So uh, anyway, I like it. It's Hickman, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drinking the Hickman Kool-Aid here, expecting something <laughs> really fantastic to turn out in the end of this. So, 
What did you think of that first issue? Oh, it's interesting. I mean, that's why so I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it in trade. I mean, I thought the first issue was interesting. Um, I, the whole Illuminati thing, I don't, I don't, that totally lost me. But um, that, that piece of it, I think there, there, I needed some prior Marvel knowledge to get, to get that little bit of stuff. But um, yeah, I, the idea that there's this, um, you know, there's these villains sitting on another planet and they're shooting basically stuff at earth to um you know change the living matter that's there and stuff is is frightening but cool and they're obviously going to mess with the initial avengers and that's why you need this all these you know other avengers are being called up right i mean i to me it sounds like a cool idea i you know like i said i just didn't want to pay the you know the monthly price for what for what i my understanding is is like you just described hickman tells this big this big long story and i just think that's going to be better for me to consume in a in a trade format yeah yeah i i like i said before that i definitely agree with that i i wanted to mention um since you you brought up the cosmic creatures shooting things at earth so the last issue i read they the ex nihilo had had done that and, and basically infected the earth in various ways one of them was his purpose was to give the earth a consciousness and so he has these creatures in, in one part of the earth that are basically hatching and, and they're like these worm-like creatures and then they combine and that's, that's I guess, kind of like the brain of the earth. I guess you could, you could see it that way. Really? Hmm. And, and so these, these two new characters that they're not Avengers, but they're, they're involved in this whole thing. Um, one is referred to as Adam because he was created from Ex Nihilo as the perfect human and then there's this other guy who ends up with these basically cosmic abilities. He's the new star brand. And if you remember, do you remember the star brand character from the new universe titles from what? 84, yeah. mm-hmm. 85, something like right. that. Where, mm-hmm. where Marvel, Marvel tried to create this other universe, uh, uh separate right. from the Marvel universe. Right. Well, here's the new star brand and he's got, he's got cosmic level powers. And the Avengers are are a little concerned about it because it, it's in the body of basically this uh, teenage or you know early twenties kid, um, and it uh. it was it was interesting because they in one issue before he got this, this these powers these abilities um, they're they're showing all these panels of all these people talking to each other or talking on the phone or whatever so the focus is on those characters, but. And in the background of all of these panels, as you go through these few pages in that issue, is this kid. And he's just a nobody. He's just, he's just, you know, he's working at, at the mall in, in a fast food place. You know, he's, he's at school or whatever. And, and so he's just, you know, your normal everyday nobody who ends up getting cosmic powers. Mm. And what happens in that, that one issue where, the, you know, the brain of the earth, the consciousness of the earth is, is, is coming alive, is, is, is becoming sentient. Um, the creature thing, whatever the brain, whatever appears like it's attacking the two, the Adam and, and uh, Starbrand, And so Starbrand, you know, fights back and ends up blasting the brain. <laughs> oh, and, and Adam says basically, Oh my gosh, you, you just killed earth. Uh, uh-oh. And, and then, then the Avengers show up and go, um, you have way too much power and not enough control, and we're worried about that. <laughs> yeah. And, and they end up locking him and, and Adam in this, I don't know, this prison type thing. I, get, I, I think it's in space. I'm not entirely sure where, what exactly it is or where it is. And so that, that's how that ended. It's like, holy crap, it killed the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen with that, right? Right. Yeah. So like I said, crazy ideas. They're, they're lots of fun to read, though. Okay, uh, the last book we're going to talk about is Hawkeye. Okay, interjection time again. I'm including Hawkeye here in the discussion at this point at the end of 2012 because that's when the uh, the red bar that we discussed earlier in the episode appeared on that uh, Hawkeye issue from December. But Hawkeye certainly uh, fits the Marvel Now description, I would say, considering the the creative team on it, and the, the basically the scope and direction of that particular title. 
Anyway, back to the show again. Which, incidentally, um, was our pick for best title, best Marvel title of 2012? Yep. Which I'll be I'll be really interested uh, if we do another best of the year at the end of this year, Travis, uh-huh. to see where we're at with Marvel Comics. So uh, we talked. I think we talked pretty much at length on that uh, that best of 2012 episode about Hawkeye. Yeah. But um, what what else do we want to say about Hawkeye? Other than it's it's still it's an awesome, awesome title. Oh man, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just such a great it's just a great title, and and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what else I could say about it that I didn't spew on about a whole bunch the last time we talked about the yeah. book. Just um, just wonder wonderful characterization of Clint. Yep. Um, you know, Hawkeye. You know, is kind of in the book, but it's really about Clint and his adventures when he's not Hawkeye. <laughs> right. And it's, yeah. it is. It is so much its own thing, a separate from the rest of the Marvel hype of its own. I mean, it's just it's just a, because it's such a it's just it's so different. It's just so different than the rest of those books that are out there. I just I love it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think the only complaint I have about it is that I would like to see more of Kate Bishop. In, in the story more than she already has been right they kind of put her in there as you know you like you read the the first page you know which kind of explains what's going on in all the marvel comics you know she's always there they always show her a picture and whatnot you know here's hawkeye and then there's because she's the also hawkeye. hawkeye right you know and, and she shows up occasionally but um you know she's not in it tons um i like that character but I don't know if they over if they overused her. I think it would it would change the book. Sure. I just want a t- you know just just a little bit more. <laughs> I, I I I like the interaction between the two characters and and we're, we're the, the the latest issues they've kind of gotten away from those two being together, which uh, which is okay. Uh, I just want you know to have a fraction bring her back into the story you need to read the latest issue and i have not i have not read uh number nine uh, yet yeah so you need to read it although when i she's she's in that one so yeah when when i when i I'm, i have it on my desk here i'm looking at it right now and there so there's that one what's that one girl that showed up in the last issue the one in the, the redhead yeah candy yeah. so she shows up again right i, yep. I feel like I'm, i've read this already it's it, oh she says i, I need it, your help again it, yeah it's kind of suddenly we're we're going through the same motions we went through before yeah I and mean, that's part of the story okay. that's part of the story is right, we've so gone through the motion we've got because she shows up again and goes through these motions again uh, the other ladies in um in clint's life take more interest the second time around yeah so we kind of want to know what, they, what black widow black widow uh mockingbird Jessica and, Drew, yeah mockingbird what what's mockingbird's yeah. real name his wife his ex-wife uh, i don't <laughs> yeah. i can't remember i can't remember either i like i can't remember and each of the each of them have their own in this story each of them have their own couple pages where it's like you know you know it's clint and the ex-wife clint and the uh, the work wife and uh, Clint yeah. and the uh, girlfriend, girlfriend right? <laughs> kind of question. Yeah. yeah. And, and each of them have their own things to say to him and their own way of dealing okay. with the fact that this redhead has shut up twice now to their door kind of a thing is to, cause they all kind of want to know what's going on and they all address it in a different fashion. And it's, it's good. There's some, there's some good emotional content in, in that. And yeah. I just like, I just like how I just like Clint. He's kind of a train wreck of a character and, I, I enjoy the way we get to do that. I mean, I know a lot of people keep talking about the fact that it's kind of like ro- rewriting Rockford Files for a, a comic book. <laughs> I've not heard that before. Oh, haven't you? No. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's I think that's, that's the premise of how they're. Yeah, that's the premise of how Matt's writing it is that kind of a that kind of a level and that kind of a story. Um, but I'm I'm you know, digging it. Um, the ending of this issue is pretty tough, but. Um, oh, yeah. And her name's Bobby. I, I'm, I am flipping through the issue. Bobby, that's right. That's what it is. Just looking for that because I'm trying not to 
to but I love the imagery in that book. Yes, know? the Aja uh, art. The, oh my god. I mean, you know, now does it make sense for when they sh- when when the redhead shows up to the house that they're wearing the the clothes that they're wearing because it's kind of a throwback '60s kind of a vintage kind of look. <laughs> it to is, them. yeah. You're does right. that does that make sense? No, it probably doesn't make sense. And they wear that style of clothing all the way through, but it's just so stylized and cool being that i just is there something about it that makes it okay in that book because it just it just makes it makes the art pop that much more because they're wearing that kind of those kind of weird yeah you know dresses and stuff and and, and but the with the and the cards still stuck to their heads because obviously they're playing some version of poker where you have that one card you can't yeah. see what it is and mm-hmm. it's just hilarious yeah and and, and the covers for this series have been oh, just iconic you, you want you yeah. want to talk about uh, cover art that captures your attention when it's sitting on the news on the stands in a comic book shop yeah. or, or elsewhere and you know pulls you in because it's so different this is it mm-hmm. you know and it's and it's such a limited color palette that it's so striking um, it, it's it's wonderfully done the, I don't know you know if it, how much of this is Aja and how much of it is is fraction because I know you know fraction has, does his own thing right so right mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't care it's just it, it's working so well. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. well deserved, I think, of our our award <laughs> for yep. best Marvel comic of 2012. All right, that's uh, that brings us up to um, unless I've forgotten some, Travis brings us up through uh, December 2012 for the Marvel Now stuff. But this is probably a good time for us to uh, stop, and we'll continue our conversation about Marvel Now for the. 2013 releases in the next episode. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. Uh, anything else you want to add about these? Oh, uh, let me ask you what, out of all the stuff we've talked about, what do you think is the best? And let's exclude the like Hawkeye. Okay. <laughs> uh. What about new stuff that, you know, start something that started at number, you can count, I was going to say number one, but you can count Red She Hulk, even though it's number 58 of that series. That was a new, a new launch. That was a number one, essentially. They just didn't, Ty, uh, renumber it as number one, right? So, what what's mm-hmm. the what? What do you think is the best title we've talked about so far? The best mm, I don't, mm. out of this group. Yeah, I really enjoy FF. I, I, I to me that book is just really fun. Is it the best book? Um, yeah, I would even say it's probably the best book of that group. I just think it's a lot of fun. I'm really, I'm really enjoying Red She Hulk too, but um. I think I think um, as a whole, after the first couple issues, I think that FF is kind of firing on all cylinders right now, and mm-hmm. and 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 is em- embracing to some degree some of the stuff that goes on in the um, you know in Hot Guy, and so I I like it. Okay. How about you? Uh, I will have to go with all new X Men actually. Uh, for for the reasons I stated before, it's it's it was. Totally unexpected to be as good as it is in my mind, and the the characterizations of of especially Kitty Pride and um, Jean uh, are are wonderful, and and I can't wait to see more of that. So and and like I said, the the, the premise of it was like, are you kidding me? And yet it's working. So and with with Avengers probably being uh, number two there, just because of the the high concept of it. So mm-hmm. all right. Uh, that's it. I guess we'll 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 come back and talk about the rest of the Marvel Now titles. Uh, in the meantime, uh, people, please uh, send me feedback. You can do that by going to the uh, Mary, uh, Marius in various ways <laughs> by going to longboxreview.wordpress.com/feedback. Um, and in some of some of those ways, you, you know, like email, you can send me email at longboxreview at gmail.com. There's the voicemail. Wow, I cannot talk right now. The voicemail number is 208-953-1841. If uh, Scott Snyder can leave me voicemail, so can you. <laughs> I'm just going to use that tag until somebody else sends me a voicemail. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, uh, that's that's it. Uh, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you soon.